we're going to have uh, this number of songs, and we're going to have this number of prayers, and we're going to do a scripture reading, and uh, then it'll be your time to come up. And I said, Russ, don't you worry, I got it. I'll be, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just come up when there was a big gap. But obviously, I wasn't paying close enough attention because I, he was sort of trying to give me the nudge that it was time to come up there, and I, uh, I didn't know. I thought we were having another uh, song. It, it's, it's great to be with you again. As, as Russ said, he got in touch with me yesterday afternoon. Um, it's good to be with you. I, on, I wish it was on happier occasions, um, and our prayers are, of course, with Jessica and with uh, her family, but it is good to always be here with you. I love this congregation. I love the community of Paris. What has been recently bringing me to uh, uh, Bourbon County is um, I, I do, um, uh, as many of you know, I'm an attorney, so I've been coming to court down here, so it's usually under less uh, um, joyful circumstances under which that I have been coming to Bourbon District and Circuit Court, so it's good to be here in this uh, assembly to be with each and um, every one of you. love so many of you here, and I appreciate always getting to, um, getting to see you again. I, I've heard a story about a mailman. And he worked at the post office, and his job was to filter through the mail and pick out the letters that had um, difficult to decipher illegible addresses and try to decode those to be able to get them to the right destination. And one day, in the course of his job, he uncovered an envelope that was, had no address on it and said nothing other than the word God on the front. Well, of course, he didn't know who to send that to, and so, though I think this is a federal offense, he opened the envelope and, uh, and, and looked inside. And inside, it was in very shaky handwriting, um, a letter that read as follows, Dear God, my name is Edna, and I am an elderly widow living only on a very small pension week to week. Yesterday, someone stole my purse. It had $100 in it, and that was all the money I had until my next pension. I'd be fine, except I had invited two of my other elderly friends who not able to cook for themselves over for Christmas dinner on Sunday. And now I don't have any money to buy the groceries in order to have that dinner. I don't know what to do. Don't have any friends. Don't have any family in which to turn. You are my only hope. Sincerely, Edna. Well, the post worker, was his heart melted. He fished in his pockets for some money. He went around to the other people at the post office looking for some additional money. Together, they scraped together $96. They put it in an envelope, sent it back to Edna, and they all felt a glow about the good deed that they had done that morning with Edna. Christmas came and went. And uh, sure enough, a few days later, another letter came in the mail addressed only to God. The postal workers all gathered together, opened up the envelope, and read the letter aloud. And it said, Dear God, this is Edna again. I cannot thank you enough for the great gift of love that you gave to me by giving me um, that money to be able to have the dinner. We had a delicious dinner. My friends and I had a wonderful time, and we just cannot thank you enough for what you did for us. I did want to let you know, however that it was four dollars short. <laughs> My suspicions are it was taken by those crooks at the post office. <laughs> Sincerely, Edna. No good deed goes unpunished. That's what we say sometimes, right? When we do something good, it turns around and comes back to um, haunt us. However, I'm inclined to believe that among people identifying themselves as Christians in our world today, that good deeds themselves have become under appreciated. When I looked up the word good deeds online and looked at uh, various Church of Christ and other uh, religious groups websites, one of the things that was most prominently said about good deeds were these two stern warnings. Caution. Good deeds will not, I repeat, not get you to heaven. And good deeds will not, I repeat, not take away your sins. Now, those are undoubtedly true cautions, and those are undoubtedly true warnings, but um, they are only part of the truth. For, for the few moments that we have together, I would like to direct our minds to a few scriptures discussing good deeds, or what the scripture might also call good works, benevolence, or um, even charity. Uh, because those 
passages remind us that doing good deeds for other people help others that we are around, but also that while good deeds may not be in themselves sufficient to be able to get us to heaven, we will see, I believe, that good deeds certainly are a symptom of those people who are in their lives, heavenward bound. Go ahead and open up to the book of Acts, if you will. I'll make a few comments before um, we get there. You can't read the New Testament or the Gospels very long before you catch our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the act of doing something good. Though John says in John chapter 21, 24 through 25, that if everything, that all the books of all the world could not uh, hold the great doings of uh, Jesus Christ, in the, in the accounts of his life that we have recorded in the four Gospels, depending on who's counting, there's about 40 miracles that we have recorded of Jesus Christ. Now, the purpose of those miracles, of course, are to confirm the words that he's preaching and to show that he was, in fact, the Son of God and is the Son of God. And some of those miracles really uh, are, are simply demonstrating his power over nature. For example, he walked on the water. He um, caused the miraculous haul-in of those um, fish at the, at the sailboat. But by my count, as I go through the list of miracles that Jesus did in his lifetime, all but five, about five of the miracles that Jesus did during his time on earth were done also with the purpose of helping someone who was in need. Jesus healed the sick. He drove out evil spirits from demon-possessed people. He cleansed men of leprosy. He rescued his disciples from a storm. He healed the blind, caused the lame to walk, helped the dumb to speak. He fed the hungry, raised the dead, healed an enemy with a severed ear, and, uh, and died and was resurrected to redeem you and I from our sins. Even when you look beyond the supernatural things that Jesus did in his life, you see the normal things that he did on an everyday basis were often to do good to people. Uh, the, the Gospels are enriched with several stories of Jesus going to meeting with and working with those people who are on the margins of society, the sinners and the publicans, the tax collectors, people who uh, others didn't want to deal with. Jesus worked with those people, ministered to those people in his life. Famously, of course, we have the example in the upper room when his disciples came in off the dusty streets. He got down on his hands and knees, um, the, the Savior of all mankind, the Son of God, humbled himself and washed the feet of his disciples there in the upper room. We see Jesus um, doing good as he went about in his life. And in fact, if you've got your Bibles open to Acts, go to Acts chapter 10, um, beginning in verse 34, we see one of the, one of the more, most important and most famous sermons in, in the book of Acts. Um, many of you know in that context, Peter is preaching to Cornelius. Cornelius being what we recognize the first Gentile convert. This is a very important account, right? Cornelius, we're told, is a, a, a good God-fearing person. Um, he prays to God. God heard his prayers. But Peter, in this sermon, is going to introduce him to Jesus. And if you read the whole the chapter, which we won't do today, we see that Peter does introduce Jesus in terms of his role in the redemption of man, that he was died, that he was resurrected, that he was died and resurrected for Cornelius' sins. And he tells him about Jesus' role in the scheme of redemption. But in verse 38 of Acts chapter 10, Peter, when introducing his Lord, a man with whom he had walked with in the streets of Galilee and uh, Jerusalem, begins the introduction this way. Acts 10, verse 38. Uh, he tells Cornelius about how God <coughs> anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with them. So he not only said that Jesus, not only talked about Jesus' role in the scheme of redemption, but when Peter was introducing Cornelius in one of the most important sermons in the history of time, uh, he mentions and makes time to note that when Jesus was walking around as a man, he went about doing good to other people. Now that's important because when Cornelius does obey the gospel, as we're going to see, it's going to be required of him that as he goes about in his life, that he also goes about 
doing good. Jesus walks the walk. He talks the talk. Much of Jesus' ministry is talking about how his people ought to be righteous. How they ought to be doing good to other people. For from right around the very beginning of his ministry, Matthew chapter 5, um, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he says to, to his followers, now you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see, what? Your good works. Why? So they can say how good of a guy you are. So they can praise your name. So you can get honor in the community. No. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, that in your good works they may glorify the Father who is in heaven. Jesus says that when we as Christians do good works, it shows the world the love of our Father. Now we have a lot of, we, we accuse the world a lot of times of not paying any attention to God. And they've not made time for God in their lives. They don't care about God. Well, maybe in return, we ought to, as God's representatives here on earth, show those people more love, do more good to those people, because they may feel that, that God's people have forgotten about them. We've got to love the people that we see. And in loving and doing good to those people, doing good to the people who are around us, we show them the love of God in the things that we do. Matthew chapter 6, if you'll turn over there, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, take heed, this is one of my favorite passages, still in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, take heed that you do uh, not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest thine alms, don't let thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That thine alms may be in secret, that thy father which is in secret may in secret himself reward thee openly. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture because I like the imagery. And because when I was a kid, um, if, you, if you started to brag on yourself, then my family would get you with this passage. You, I may have told you this before, but um, you know, if you start to talk about how good you were or how good of something you had done, you'd hear kind of off in the distance, either my mom or my dad or my brother give you one of these. Toot, toot, and they were saying to you, you're blowing, you know, you're blowing your horn out in front of the stuff that you're doing. The imagery here is that the scribes and the Pharisees, when they, they would do good things, which was good. Um, and, but, but you see, when they would do the good thing, they'd blow their horn well, everyone, you've got, you've got this guy, you've got Hornblower at work, right? You, you know that you've, you've got this person in your family. They, they blow the horn. I'm about to do something good. Everybody look. I'm about to give some money to charity. You know, you've got, right, you've got those people in your, um, in, in your life. Jesus says, don't do that. He, he says, do it, do it in secret. But a couple of points that are laced in with what he says, um, look back at... Um, uh, look, look back uh, in verse 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Jesus is assuming, he's baking it in the cake, that they're doing alms, that they're giving to the people who are poor, that they're helping the people that are needy. That's an expectation that Jesus has. He's taking it as a given that the people that he's talking to, that his followers, are going to be doing good. And then at the end of verse 1, he says, Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Clearly, this verse contemplates that Jesus has an expectation that his people do good to the people who need him. And there's a clear expectation here that when we do good to our fellow man and help those people who are in need, then Jesus, that God will reward us for the good things that we do. This continues throughout Jesus' ministry. Towards the end, in Matthew chapter 25, there's the famous scene where Jesus is separating the, the sheep from the goats. And he tells the sheep, 
Now, Christine and I have a sheep named Popcorn, um, and we are, Jesus is the good shepherd, and we are the bad shepherd. We never go visit Popcorn. You know, Jesus, the sheep know his voice. My sheep wouldn't even recognize me if I, um, if I came up. I'm not much of a shepherd. But he's separating the, you know, the sheep from the goats. And right, the, the sheep, they get to come into the kingdom. They get to come into everlasting life. But the goats, they, they're told to depart right into, into outer darkness, right? Well, what's the difference? What, 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 in this passage, what's the difference between the people who were told to come in and the people who were told to go out? Well, in the context, in the actual text itself, the difference is the sheep fed the hungry. They gave something to drink to the thirsty. They clothed the people who were naked. They took in the people who were strangers. They visited the sick and the afflicted and the people who are in prison. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, and, and not saying, that, that it's good works that get us into heaven, but I think clearly God's paying attention. He's told him to reward the people who do good works. He has an expectation that we do good works, and I think it's clear here that it seems to be a symptom of the people who are going to heaven, that they are righteous and do good works in their life. Perhaps the best illustration in Jesus' ministry takes place in Matthew chapter 22 and also Luke chapter 10. And he's asked in, in uh, Luke 22 or Matthew 22, what's the greatest command? Luke 10. He's asked, um, what, what shall we? What, what can we do to obtain um, eternal life? And um, <coughs> he says, uh, you know, the first command is to love the love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. The second command is like the first to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, then the lawyer, the slippery lawyer. He comes in looking for a loophole. He says, well, you say love your neighbor as yourself, but in Palestinian code uh, 235.26, neighbor can be defined in a number of different ways, and I think we can all agree that... Right, so he, get, he sort of tries to find a loophole as to who his neighbor is. I don't want to love these people over here, so let's try to define them out as our neighbor. Let's have an exception for people that we don't like. Um, and so, so the question that is posed to Jesus is, well, who is our neighbor? He tells a story that we can all quote. Every child uh, in, the, in the audience can quote it. Everybody's had a felt board of this poor Jewish man who is, um, who's jumped. All of his possessions are stolen from him, and he's left beaten and half dead in the gutter. Here comes a Jewish religious person. Here comes a priest down the street. We're saved, everyone thinks. This guy, they'll help him surely. Um, but he says, Woo, I'm not getting over on He passes kind of on the, um, on the other side. Levite comes through. He says, well, that priest had, the, had a good idea. Um, I think I'll pass on the other side as well. And then who, who comes up? Uh, a third person comes up with the Samaritans. Oh, the great enemies of the Jews. Terrible hatred between the Samaritans and, um, and the Jews. But, but what does this man do? The Samaritan, who history and, uh, has passed down to us, is the good Samaritan. He sees this beaten up Jewish man on the ground, and we're told that he is moved with compassion for him. Now then what he does is interesting. He gets off his beast. Now, I don't know what kind of beast it is. I actually tried to look it up this time, what, what, what kind of beast he was riding. I don't know. I used to, when I was a little kid, I used to watch He-Man, and he had, a, he had Battle Cat. He used to ride around on that, and that was his beast. And, but I bet it wasn't Battle Cat he was riding around. It was a horse or a camel or a mule. Or I don't know what he was riding on. But anyway, he was up on a beast, it said, and he gets off his, sometimes we call it the high horse. He gets off his high horse. He rolls up his sleeves picks up the man who's been beaten, and what does he do? Puts him on top of it. He puts him back on his beast. He, he takes him to the end, binds his wounds, puts him up. I don't know what was on his calendar that day, probably not helping a guy who'd gotten beaten up in the, uh, laying in the gutter, but he clears his schedule. He cares for him, ministers to his needs. The next day he has to go. He's got an engagement that he has to take care of, but he leaves money to the innkeeper says, use this to tend to him, use this to take care of his expenses, and if he has more expenses, then lay them to my charge. The point of this parable is to illustrate the second and great command to love your neighbor as yourself. Now notice, 
Now, this is not a parable about just being nice or polite to someone that you don't like in the hallway at work. I mean, we like to think of that as a victory. You know, mean person at work walks down the hallway, we say, morning. Now, that's not what the Good Samaritan did, right? And that's nice. It's good if you do that. But now that's not what the Good Samaritan did. That's not what he was praised for. The, the, the Good Samaritan did not, um, did not recommend the, the, uh, the, the, it's not a story about a great government program that helped the needs of the person there in, in, in the area. Now those are good. Sometimes a good program will help um, somebody, but that's not what it's, that's not what it's about. It's not about it, 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 the, 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 um, uh, the Good Samaritan didn't, didn't stop by a place and make a donation to the local um, charity and say, I hope you'll use that donation to help that poor man that's in the gutter. I mean, giving of his money is a, is a good thing. He did do some of that, but that's not what the um, parable is about. It's about a person who looked, who saw a need, saw someone who needed help. He, got, he, he gave of his time, sacrifice of his time, sacrifice of his abilities, sacrifice of his money to get down off of his horse, his beast, and help somebody who was in need. This principle is continued to be discussed throughout the pages of the New Testament. Jesus talked about it. So did his followers talk about it as well. We see Paul talking about it at the very beginning of his ministry and again toward the very end of his life in, in the book of Galatians, uh, which was probably thought to be written in one of his first um, writings. Uh, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, uh, we read, Paul writes, As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. Now that may be something that I, I might have thought myself as I, as, I, as I was thinking about how um, I hadn't been very much like the Good Samaritan. I might think, well, I just don't have very many opportunities. Um, and, um, and Paul says that I have opportunity. I ought to do good to the household of faith. And so I, like the lawyer, I'm sort of out on a, on a loophole. I know a couple of quotes about opportunity, I think, are, are, that speak to that. Uh, the great Mark Twain, he said, I, I seldom um, see an opportunity until it ceases to be one. That's true. Why is that the case? Edison, Thomas Edison, the great inventor, um, he says that opportunity is missed by most because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Now that's why we miss a lot of opportunity because, because it, we're busy and because it's hard and, and, and doing good to other people, the opportunity to do good to other people requires sacrifice of us and we're too busy and we don't have the time and it's going to be hard work and we say, well, somebody else will probably take care um, well, somebody else will probably take care of that. The other thing I saw, now this is not as um, <coughs> a reputable source as Edison and Twain and Paul, um, but, uh, but there's a little, a little kid who's kind of a YouTube sensation named Kid President. I don't know if you all have seen him, but actually the writer of Kid President is a Freed Hardeman graduate, and, um, and it's this little boy, and they dress him up in a suit, and he will make sort of a, uh, announcements, of funny, you know, witty things that he says, and uh, he says that, uh, that there are too many selfies in the world. Now, you all know about selfies. That's, you know, we, we like ourselves so much that we have to take all of our pictures of ourselves. There's even sticks, and you can hold the stick out and take a picture of your um, phone to capture and share with the world who's desperate to know about all of your doings, um, all the things that you are doing. Kid President says, we need less selfies and more other people lees. Now that's why we don't see a lot of opportunities too, and 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 this would be the this would be the uh, this would be my problem. Sometimes we're too self-absorbed. I'm living in Drew world. I'm thinking about all Drew things I have to do, and um, and and because I am, am so absorbed in here with me, I, I I'm not looking like the person who um, uh, like like the Good Samaritan was. Maybe that's what happened with the Levite and the um, and, and and the priest. Maybe, he, maybe they were thinking about their sermon. Maybe they were thinking about all the other things they had to do. Maybe they were thinking about themselves and didn't even see the, um, the, the person who had been beaten on the side of the road. That's what happens to us. We, we are so, we're so self-involved that we don't see the, the, the needs other people have. Let me tell you, there's not a person in this room who doesn't have a need. There's not a person in this need that doesn't have a problem. 
There's not a person in this room who, doesn't, who isn't thinking to themselves, I wish I had somebody to talk to or help me get over the issues that we had. At least th that would be a huge minority of people who just, everything's fine, I'm smooth sailing, don't anybody try to help me, I got it all taken care of um, on, on my own. I tell you, at your work and your family, with, with, you know, wherever you go um, to, to eat, there's somebody there that could use you to invest in yourself in their life and help them with something that they need, have a problem that you could help them get over. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. Um, at the end of Paul's life, the, he was writing what some people call the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, very short epistles. But in those epistles, he on eight occasions references the importance of good works. And we don't have time to go through all of those this morning, but a sampling of them I think would be helpful. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 10, he's talking about the widows. He encourages care and help of the people who are widows. So not only does he say you ought to help those people um, who, who are widows, but he then praises the widows who are, quote, well reported of good works. What kind of good works were the widows well reported of? They brought up their children, lodged strangers, washed the saints' feet, and relieved the afflicted. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 18, Paul is talking to people with a lot of money, the rich people. He says to the rich people, if you are um, rich, be also rich in good works. Use what you have to help other people. People in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul encourages, and this is what we read, this was the scripture reading that was earlier, Paul encourages the young men of the church to show themselves as a, in a pattern of good works, that in conjunction with sound speech, they may live a life that no one, even their opponents, even their enemies, can't have anything to say against them and would be ashamed to say anything against them. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Paul notes that Jesus gave himself for us that we might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That in those good works no men would be able to despise us. Now think about the narrative that are of religious people today. The narrative in the media, right, right or wrong, the narrative in the media is that the church religious people today are closed-minded, hateful, bigoted. They're against inclusion and equality. And the church, as a result of that, is, 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 is talked bad about and disparaged by a number of people in the national media, in the workplaces, in our schools. Now, I believe strongly that we ought to stand up for the truth. But as we're standing up for the truth, we ought to with equal zeal be doing good to all men as we find opportunity to do it. Now, um, I, my, my, I'm from Paintsville. That's where I'm from. They had a big um, flood down there not too long ago. And, um, and we participate in a program for, for disaster relief victims. And, um, and in comes a big truck. And the truck has all sorts of supplies, wheelbarrows and food and clothing and, um, and all sorts of things that people who uh, were victims of a terrible flood might need uh, to have. And the members of the Paintsville Church took off work and uh, took wheelbarrows to people who needed them, food and clothes, um, took money from donations that had been taken up from congregations. I know North Lexington sent some down, their own congregation, helped pay them to have a place to stay for a period of time. Now, those people whose lives lives had been upended by a, terrible, by a terrible disaster, who didn't have food or clothing or the things that they needed for their daily lives, who, who needed help from someone. When, when the church came through with the things that they need and gave them a helping hand, do you think they're listening to the national news media who says that the church is hateful? This congregation, I think, that does a breakfast for people um, at, in the mornings. Do you all still do that or did do that? Um, and, and those people who, who may or may not have been able to, I think it's for everybody, but some folks who may not be able to have gotten breakfast that morning, when they, uh, when they have come here, been able to get a need for, the, for, for their body, do you think they're listening when the national news media says that the church is hateful? Because the church has shown them love, has done good for those, for those people. We ought to stand for the truth, brethren. But there'd be a lot more negativity toward the church and the religious world if we were standing like Jesus and not only standing for the truth, but also going about doing good. Doing good to other people as we had the opportunity. Being zealous for good works. Timothy, 
um, along the same lines. Uh, I'm sorry, Paul in uh, Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, writes along the same lines. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for the people. Paul says to Titus, look, if people are, you're not saved by the good works that you've done. You're saved because, because, Jesus had mer- because God had mercy upon you through His grace. He gave you the opportunity for redemption through Jesus Christ and through the shedding of His blood. But... He says that you who have been saved through Jesus ought to be careful to devote yourselves to good works because it is excellent and profitable. For who? For the people who need help. For the people who are struggling. For the, for the disaster victims. For the people who, haven't, who, who are hungry. For the people who have problems in their lives. It's profitable for those people, but it's also profitable for the individual Christians who are doing uh, who are doing the helping. What's the point, Drew? What's your point? You've been up here droning on now for the, for the whole time. Let, let's, get, let's get to your point. Oh, no, my paper's here. I've lost. Um, what, what, what's, your, what's your point? Maybe no good deed goes unpunished. Maybe we cannot work our way to heaven through good deeds. But if you look at the life of Christ, His teachings, the teaching of the New Testament, it's clear. Good deeds don't make you a Christian but they are perhaps the most easily recognizable symptoms of Christianity. If your skin doesn't have red bumps on it and it's not itching, you probably ain't got the chicken pox. If you're not nauseous and you're not throwing up, you probably don't have the stomach virus. And if you have to think very far back to the last time that you got down off your horse and helped somebody who needed it, it's time to be concerned about how infected we are with Christianity. Jesus went about doing good and taught his disciples to do the same. And the rest of the New Testament tells us that we are to do good to all men, have a pattern of good works, be zealous for good works, and be devoted to good works. Good deeds are a symptom of Christianity. Let me share um, a couple more very brief thoughts in the short time that we have together this morning. Many of you may think we don't have any more time together this morning, Drew, but, um, but yeah, I've got the pulpit, so <coughs> I've got a few more minutes, I guess. Either way. Now, um, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to, um, just to say that we ought to do good deeds because God's making us do it. Or we ought to do good deeds just for the sake of doing them or because God is rewarding us. In reality, when we read Scripture, it's the other way around. You do not do good deeds to become a mature Christian. The result of becoming a good Christian and a mature Christian is that you will find yourself doing good deeds. Open your Bibles to first, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. <coughs> Peter writes, Simon Peter, a sermon, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you, the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according to his divine power, hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers in the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and a virtue knowledge, and a knowledge temperance, and the temperance patience, and a patience godliness, and a godliness brotherly kindness, and a brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, 
and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. Peter here is talking to save people. He's talking to the church. And he says unto these people that as Christians, you ought to have faith. Having faith is good. That's important, but it's not enough. You've got to grow in your faith. You've got to add to your faith various attributes that <coughs> build on top of each other. Virtue to knowledge, knowledge to temperance, temperance to patience, godliness to brotherly kindness, and uh, what your translation may call love, what my old King James that I stick to is called, uh, writes as charity. Now, I, I, um, I, I, I've enjoyed this book, and I like this quote from it. In, um, in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes about the meaning of the word charity as expressed here. Charity now means simply what used to be called alms, that is, giving to the poor. Originally, it had a much wider meaning. You can see how it got in the modern sense. If a man has charity... Giving to the poor is one of the most obvious things he does. And so people come to talk as if it were the whole of charity. In the same way, rhyme is the most obvious thing about poetry. So people come to mean poetry is simply rhyme and nothing more. Charity or love is something much more than doing good deeds. But if we have love for other people, charity or doing good deeds for them is something that will overflow from a heart. That is full of love. And notice where Peter places charity on his list of attributes. The idea is that each of the listed attributes grow out of the previous one and is strengthened by and perfected by the other. And charity is at the pinnacle, at the end of this list. The, I know there are several Rogerses here today, the great Bart Rogers, who is one of my great mentors, and he's meant so much to me in my life, taught one of the great Bible classes that I have um, ever been in before my life. It was, uh, it, was a, it was a Bible class, a two-part Bible class. You ought to get it. The podcasts are up um, at North Lexington's website on uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And he, and he began, I'll never forget it, he began the, the class sort of apologetically. He said, now I know many of you will, uh, will sort of scoff at spending two um, Bible classes uh, on such a basic concept of love. And he was sort of apologetic by, um, by, uh, by, as though he didn't want to insult our intelligence by talking about such a basic idea. And in some ways I felt the same way about talking about something as basic as good deeds. But Peter says it's really the other way, it's really the other way around. We talk about um, uh, redemption and salvation as it's through these great complex topics that only people who have studied for years and years can be able to understand. But Peter says, now those things are the basics. You've got to have those things down first. Those are the things you, you, you know, you, you've got to understand. And, and the hard part, the more complicated things to actually do and practice in your life are the things like being a person of virtue, being righteous, understanding and learning more about God, exercising self-control to help you from sin, and at the pinnacle of those, exercising love towards other people. Think about the good Samaritan. He, um, he, he rode up on his horse, saw a man in need, he didn't make a big announcement. He wasn't trying to get accolades. He wasn't trying to check something off of his list. He looked down and decided to help that person. Not because God was making him. Not because he wanted to, to, to get accolades from people, other men. He helped that person because he had compassion on them. We ought to do good for other people in our lives because we care so much about our neighbors we're looking for ways to help them, and we want to show God's love through our good works. If good works is a symptom of Christianity, it is brought about by an infection of love. Finally, I'll note this, and this is just a, just a minute of, uh, of your time. I'll, I'll say this, that there are a lot of ways that we can do good to other people, certainly giving uh, in the offering that we're about to do is one such way that we can do it. I mean, it's difficult for a lot of people to do what I call sing past the plate, um, and they, they, their mind is stuck in televangelist world where, it's, where the, the big televangelist who's flown his big jumbo jet from his big mansion in there is, um, is, is saying to the people, put, you know, put, give your money to Jesus, but put my name on the check. Um, so my dad always used to say during the, the, when the televangelists were on there. But, but, um, but, but I grew up as the son of an elder, and, um, and I know what happens to the money that goes into the plate. 
Um, the, the people who are the elders here, uh, the deacons here at this congregation, are using that money to help the people of our number who have needs that arise during the time that they're coming. So one way we can do that is to give of ourselves to help uh, those people in benevolently who have needs. Having said that, I think this is a really important point that needs to be made. Um, the, the, the good deeds that are expected of us and the flow from a loving Christian is non-delegable. It's non-transferable, and it cannot be outsourced to someone else. Now, this is a misconception that exists in our society, right? I mean, I, I've been reading Night Comes to the Cumberlands, which I think so far has been a very biased um, account of the, um, of the settling of eastern Kentucky, but nonetheless. Um, uh, in Night Comes to the Cumberlands, you read about the people that he's called the mountaineer, and the mountaineer comes and he chops down his own wood, makes his own house, and sews his own clothes, and, and catches his own food, and makes it all by himself. But that's not typically how our society works um, in, in today's time. I mean, we don't. I didn't make this suit um, and didn't build my house that I live in. I I uh, learned a specific skill and a trade, and I do a particular job and um, get paid for that, and then use that thing to buy my suit and, um, and and buy my house. But you're very wrong indeed if you're laboring under the delusion that you can put your money in the plate and have someone else do your good works for you. There are some things, brethren, that a man must do for themselves. I'm reading it. I had just finished a great book called The Ten Books That Every Conservative Must Read, um, Four Not to Miss, and One in Poster by a guy named Dr. Benjamin Weicker. And he makes the same point about democracy. He says, and I quote, um, The democratic contention is that government helping rule the tribe is a thing like falling in love. It's not something analogous to playing the church organ, painting on vellum, discovering the North Pole, looping the loop, or being astronomer royale and so on. For these things we do not wish a man to do at all unless he does them well. It is on the contrary a thing analogous to writing one's own love letters or blowing one's own nose. These things we want a man to do for himself, even if he does them badly. We engage in the activity of self-government for the same reason we engage in the activity of self-exercise. If someone else does either for us, we are robbed of any benefit. Someone else governing for us is like having someone else do our own push-ups or take our own walk. Now this is easy for me to say because I'm not your preacher um, and, and you're, not, you're not paying me any money and uh, it's, it's, more, it's more difficult for, for, for the regular minister to say this but, but you, you, you can't, you're not paying your preacher to do your good works for you. You're not. You can't do it. If, if you think that you can delegate the good works that you ought to be doing then you're wrong. It, it's completely counter to the New Testament. It's like having someone else do your own push-ups. It's like having somebody else blow, your, blow their nose for you. It, it, it robs you of the good that you have to be doing in your life. I'm sure that Clay is doing a lot of great works. I'm sure he's teaching other people. He's visiting people who are sick. But that doesn't take away your responsibility to also do those things in your life. We as Christians are tasked with going about doing good. Not because we're checking off the list. Not because we want accolades. Not because God's making us do it. But because we love the people who are around us. We love our friends and neighbors. Doing good works to other people is non-negotiable, non-delegable, and non-transferable. We ought to do that in our life. Good deeds are a symptom of Christian living. It comes about by, uh, as a result of an infection of love. And, um, it, we do our good deeds to help other people to show God's light in a dark world, to make it hard for the world to criticize Christianity, um, to uh, give us an indication of how we're doing in our growth as Christians and to make this a better world in which we live. Let me encourage you to look for opportunities to get down off your beast, to get down off your high horse, to think about somebody but you and do good to other people, to show God's love to them and to go about doing good as Jesus did, to take the opportunities to do good to all of those, especially those who are of the household of faith. But as I've said repeatedly through this, we... We're not going to be able to work ourselves to heaven no matter how many good deeds you do, no matter if you're the best good deed doer that's ever been done in the world. We've got to be obedient to, to Jesus. We, we, were, we, were, we were lost. We, we were without hope. But the grace of God and through His mercy, Jesus came, lived among us the perfect life and died as the perfect and only sacrifice that we could have had in our lives. And, and through Him we have conditional pardon. We have pardon if we'll hold up our end of the deal. If, if, we will, if we'll hear his word and believe it. 
And if we repent of the sins that we have done in our lives, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and be immersed in water to have our sins washed away, we'll come up with our um, with ha- having had pardon for the sins that we have had in our life. And then we can start we can start trying to live. We can start trying to live and show the good works um, that we are commanded to do in Scripture. If you haven't been living a, a, the kind of life that would bring honor to God, that shows the good works to your friends and neighbors who are with you, let's start doing that. Let's start doing it starting today, starting tomorrow. Show God's love to them. If you're somebody who has not rendered full obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got the opportunity to do that now as together we stand and sing the invitation song.